So we're part of the STAGE program and it's really exciting because of the research that they've been doing and the way that they've reached out to other institutions um, and connected to their programs. And I'm really excited because Soledad asked us to propose a topic to talk about and we chose spaces of unexpected learning counter strategies of world making. And I think that works uh, extremely well for both of your practices, actually, and also for the collaborative work, Cyanoban protocol that we're currently exhibiting here at Kunstwerk Trondheim and also at the Galleria Municipal do Porto. So I was wondering, when you were um, making the work, did you have conversations in particular about sort of um, counter strategies of unexpected learning? And I'm thinking maybe, Paula, you can start because uh, you've been doing all of this work that is where you find sort of alternatives or counter strategies to particular models, especially of medicine and Western European medicine. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about the counter strategies that you were engaged with in your work. This unexpected knowledge uh, has always a great um, big implication on, my, on the work I develop because I usually do performance, the performance of science this means like uh, I'm not really a scientist, but I perform when I do science. I mean, it's connected with, uh, I don't need to have all the knowledge if I want to make a project, I don't need to have all the knowledge in science, but I want to focus in something that I want to really do. And all this um, intention and way of doing things, it comes from the DIY um, politics, let's say, or like in a punk extent, they, they were doing the things that they need to do, no? for this kind of medicine and this uh, is more like prevention, not uh, cure, it's not like something is for pre prevention and knowledge and know how the things are working. Not about how we, now we need to find a cure for something, no? is on my point. <clears throat> of course, there is many things that as we were <clears throat> exploring like extractions of plants and alkaloids and many other things that they work for cancer and they work for all many, many things. As connections with the transhack feminism pues, came from dadas por contextos específicos de colaborativos no que eh, diferentes personas que hackeaban o género o que hackeaban tecnología juntábamos y hacíamos ahí laboratorios comunes. ¿no? Pues trabajos a mayor que tenían un, eh, una pegada más individual, a juntarse en una red de entramados y e decir, vale, con las cosas de biología podemos comenzar, aparte de mirar las plantas, ya teníamos mirado los fluxos de todo el cuerpo, tal, no sé qué, entonces surgió como idea de trabajar los aspectos de la ginecología autogestionada. ¿no? Eh, what we are doing is a bit like queerizing the science, like the, the heteronormative science because we are uh, just taking the, the chance to try and do the things no? through the experiments. And as we are in the 21 century, like there is many information in, in internet we can access, like protocols. Um, we have a huge network of people that they are working on biohacking as bacteria and other trans feminist uh, people that they are involved in these kind of projects. So the thing is like we are learning together and now with Diana it's like we are learning and building a big network of influence um, people that uh, uh, inspire, inspire but also help and also share and also evolve together. No, no, this is great. Um, um, before, you know, I was a curator for TBA 21 Academy. So, and as mm -hmm. part of that work, I was... Uh, I spent some time in this marine um, biology research uh, station and, um, and you know, I had this incredible respect towards science, thinking that, okay, everything that happens in the lab and, you know, all of the things that are being, the, the journal articles that are being written, um, published in nature, it's amazing, but in the end, when you are in these labs, the you know there's a bunch of Tupperware boxes where people collect algae and then they change the water <laughs> every day, and that's it, right? And it's ex it's extremely sort of um, profane, and also it is absolutely not. Um, there's nothing mystical about it, or there's nothing you know 
uh, that sh that should elevate it to that position where we in Western societies often consider it. And so mm -hmm. I like this approach of actually learning the stuff on the internet, the stuff that is safe to practice and that we can learn ourselves. There's knowledge about plants that uh, keepers of traditional knowledge have had for a long time, that women have had for a long time that has simply been lost or, you know, maybe delegated to the sites. So, so revisiting that knowledge is uh, extremely important. And also what you do in your work, Diana. So you started working on the cordyceps uh, mushroom in uh, the Tibetan plateau. And then you moved on from that mushroom to the claviceps purpurea in the project that uh, we're showing at the moment, Nets of Haifi. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the way that you encountered the cordyceps first and your work death grip that you did with that mushroom. And then maybe we can move on to Nets of Haifi. Sure, absolutely. Um, when I was listening to Paula and, and thinking about the theme uh, uh, we have uh, at the moment for this project. I was also thinking like the, the, the interesting amount or diversity of world making that suddenly appears when you are connected to the land or, you know, when you explore everything that is available to create medicine, to, for your food, for, you know, for community to share. There's so much knowledge coming from that relationship with the land. And when, when I started the project um, about having Cordyceps as the, the main character of this big narrative, uh, when I went to India and Nepal for this artistic residency, I had that in mind because I felt like for the, fr the time frame I have to film and do interviews and to engage, um, with with the place and and with people, it, it it it's something that usually takes a lot of time. But beforehand, I was already uh, learning and studying the the relationships and in this case, it's a hybrid parasite host relationship. And at the time, I I was learning some articles uh, in the scientific community, which you know. Cordyceps function primarily was to treat cancer um, and was going, you know, was going in a really fast direction into like um, synthesization in, in China because the, the natural resource was becoming extinct. Um, and, and it was interesting that during that time, so this was like 2018, I started um, looking into like, you know, um, health shops and, 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 and shops where you just get like a lot of like tinctures and natural treatments. And, and I started looking at like boxes that had a lot of cordyceps uh, amounts on them, which is a fungus, you know, you don't really know if that comes from you know, a weird interaction of a caterpillar or ant or, you know, suddenly it, it was just a really fascinating universe to, to dive into. And I feel like Nepal, especially during the process of this research was, you know, the most important um, place to be because the economy was being so affected. Um, and, and, and I, I just tried to sort of like follow the natural uh, curse of things in there, which is, you know, you have harvesters going like massively going, going up in the mountains to, um, to have different stages of like camps to extract this uh, cordyceps fungus from, from the earth. I wanted to do something with this um, idea of like observing a mutualist relationship, a mutualist relation between multi-species, in this case, the parasite and the fungus and the, and the vegetal, right? So you have sort of like different kingdoms crossing together while also observing this sort of like wider global impacts of, of this resource and the, the mass uh, extraction of, of this natural resource. I think was a very important um, process for me to also be connected with uh, 
women from there, women workers, but not only. There is a very sort of like uh, oppressed um, spiritual, uh, you know, religious feel in, in women's life, like with the Hinduism and what is their relationship with this work of being like um, in the land, having like this ancestral knowledge of knowing exactly how to pick it, how to preserve it. The whole process of like trading, it's, it's very controlled by, by women in, in this case. And, and then suddenly I was, I was very interested in the fact that this fungus also worked as currency for sex work like in, in, the, in the camps, but also, you know, suddenly we start talking about sex work. This is a very delicate subject. And then because you are menstruated, you have to be taken away because it's, you know, it's something that is seen as impure and dirty. So you can't stay with the community. You need to go um, away for, you know, as long as you are bleeding. So that was something I, you know, I was very sort of like struck by it. And the, the script is very much based on those, on those stories. Yeah. And what you were saying about the different connections, you know, of this mushroom to the economy, to local livelihoods, to women, to climate. Um, it reminds me very much, and we talked about this before, of Anat Singh's really beautiful book the mushroom at the end of the world where she also mm -hmm. writes about the matsutake mushroom and you know pickers yeah. in oregon and how they're connected to japanese mushroom connoisseurs and basically looking at these different scales and how they are very different but nonetheless connected in messy and uh, myriad ways and so i was thinking that this very much connects also to the or connects both mushrooms that you've worked with now, the cordyceps and the claviceps. And uh, the claviceps, because of the COVID pandemic, among other things, you ended up working with because you weren't able to go back to uh, China, actually, where you were supposed to have a residency. Mm. And so that gave us the opportunity to look more into European histories as well. And it was such an amazing coincidence that this mushroom was found and played such an important role in Portugal, Spain, but also Russia and Norway. Paula, I was thinking about you because you moved back to Galicia quite recently <laughs> and, uh, and the claviceps mushroom has played such an important role also for, the, um, for Galicia and for Gallegan economies. There was a pharmaceutical company who was industrially farming the ergot uh, and it was used in medication but it is nonetheless connected also to what you were talking about, Diana, with your research in um, India, Nepal, and so on. So, you know, the fact that this mushroom actually played such an important role in bodies throughout European history, infecting mm -hmm. people during the uh, Middle Ages, being connected to the witch trials, where women were reported to, um, to have caused hallucinations, gangrene, and all of these physical effects and then still playing a role actually all through this 20th century. It was like the, the most amazing coincidence, uh, you know, sort of like jumping from the Ayurvedic medicine to the more Western yeah. context, because when you are driving between Portugal and Galicia, you don't know the difference. Yeah, you don't know the difference. It's a planting and it's like, it's, it's the same. same land and it's <laughs> out of the same language. So. I mean, actually discovering that, you know, uh, by driving there was... Oh, nice. Nice. That you, was super yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously we understood each other talking in each language, but this, this really interesting fact that between borders, there's nothing separating it because no, no. it's the same. So you grow the same things. Um, uh, the plants and herbs have the same name you know even like in the full mm. terms like the use for yeah. it it's, it's yeah it's fascinating like it, yeah. if actually like when i when i talked to to paula uh, for the first time she told me my grandmother always 
told me about the the ergo you know like <laughs> my house and it, it's something you will not find uh, more information apart from like your neighbors or, yeah. or your grandma you know it's so it kind of appears like that with stories from the people actually hallucinating in the fields without knowing why or the or the animals so it's it's pretty intense estamos en realidad de, uh -huh. sí especulando de algo que pasó no 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 pasado cómo transportar esto presente pero tenemos que tener claro si no hay un sustituto si no hay una cosa mejor sabe qué quiere decir tal más con una planta que tiene problemas na, no ámbito de medicina por intoxicación no por qué. Ah, mira aquí. Va a procurar esta. Oh, I feel that the throughout the pandemic we're looking more sort of towards our own surroundings where we currently are and I was wondering actually Diana because you did this research in India and how did you sort of reconcile being there as a visitor for a limited amount of time and you know working with knowledge that comes from a specific place that has been held by people there for such a long time and then bringing mm -hmm. it into your art projects. I mean there's a big community a ne Nepalese community in Lisbon um uh where you know very close to the area where i grew up and i was always very curious to actually do that field work and go and record and have the opportunity to do that at some point because it's you know it's there's there's fascination which will sort of fascination with the pal in portugal and um and i was very aware of of my presence there and it's something I feel like it's something you know uh, when you are there and you prepare you have a plan but your plan doesn't mean anything because it's kind of like you need to put yourself in a very intuitive place you know what feels right you know how much you can sort of like plan to be in one place and then suddenly you can't because it, you're not allowed or not welcome or a mistranslating problem or you know something can happen when you're traveling especially uh, uh, if you travel like a woman solo like in this case and it was really really amazing because it just felt like you know I had a very clear idea and obviously I was not trespassing any properties you know it was public land people claim that land because it's being privatized due to the profit that is um, that is having, right? It's It's been like this gold rush for the last 15 years, like especially like in the last years. And the fact that I could, you know, talk to people straight away and tell them what kind of, I wanted to tell their story. And also like having this important conversation of, what people would like to 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 pass or what kind of mm -hmm. uh, narrative should be told right because it's not just the the activism that has been done there or the 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 floristation projects and cultivating more herbs so people can actually live more from their land uh, and from more species and not just that specific resource right because it's gone so this whole thing um, um, of like changing a new chapter to China to look into these modes of synthesization of this resource, uh, which is also possible now. They've been trying that for 50 years, so it's possible. But there's this friction, right, between Nepal, Tibet, the, the sort of like uh, violence that happened there. Uh, so in terms of like, territory and politics it's something that is still very very fresh and, and and present but i was lucky enough to you know to get like very good conversations and help of some people including like you know like a herbs market where people are selling 
everything they are planting from there and they explain to you uh, what what is the function for everything so it, i was actually you know super lucky because people were very understandable um and and i had very good guiding but that that doesn't happen sometimes you know and if you, you need to be aware where you are and if you can be there and and what kind of you know always respecting a lot the fact that you are not in you know a comfortable uh place but well, I think the sort of extraction that people have experienced you know of the land but also of information that people got they come from outside and take information and use it for something often people don't see the results of it or get you know information yeah. back basically so i think yeah, there's like important this to, to to construct like uh communication about what you want to do um because you know all sorts of extraction comes like this you know like different situations that people really feel um invaded and 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 it it was i think you know when you need uh to go ahead or just to leave i think it's important if you do like field work it's it's something that feels right you know you know you're doing like is is like is the result of having this interaction because this part of the counter strategies is also to not give away knowledge or to obscure or the right to you know keep uh, knowledge that is only intended for a certain group or for individuals yeah and protect that i think that's also sure. incredibly important to respect absolutely yeah especially there because you know this this cordyceps is also very sort of uh um it's like a deity you know a deity in the mountain so he's treated like a spirit is treated like as something sacred mm -hmm. that's why women when they menstruate they can't they can't pick it from the land because the impurity of it into like something sacred it i mean it's just really complicated to understand like in in one sentence but it's really interesting when the 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 resource itself have this bigger spiritual life this bigger you know presence in the mountain in the whole mountain and they have to perform rituals before they actually pick it from the land. So there's that, you know, this is a practice. It's not just going there and... So I want to say that in 2014, I was in Indonesia and I want to mention that because it was a really big event that Hacteria organized. And I think we were like uh, 100 people there, like uh, doing research about the land, about the, the influence of the uh, volcano Merapi, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and about, about the river. So we were doing biohacking for all of that things. And I want to come back this situation because people there also know a lot about plants and they, they do everything DIY. I mean, it's really connected with Portugal and Galicia. I mean, probably if we talk about Madrid or Barcelona, it's also the same, but I think Galicia and Portugal, we are not really industrialized as the other lands. So we have like kind of this uh, natural connection with, with people that really knows about the plants. But I think that what you are doing is connecting your intuition, intuition with things in another place, but just in, if we think in a quantum world, it's like uh, things happen in two, in two places at the same time, no? You are going there, but you are going there with intuition and your place is also having this sensation. I don't know if it gets the idea, but yeah. it, it's like um, you move knowledge from one, from one area to other one, to other, but I think this knowledge is already connected to the ancestors. The influence of uh, from Indonesia, in, in our sense, we also start to talk about plants, about uh, treatments from gene ecology, from there also. We connect the project with Petzblenda and Janepunk, and then we were growing many things from that, from that uh, event there. And I think it's also, I mean, we were going to the nature and talk with the people that is living in the mountains and then having knowledge and then we're sharing all the things we were also having. Oh, I was found in the uh, bioluminescent fungus, fungus there, like fox oh, wow. 
yeah, in the mountains, we were playing oh, something, so and I was like, how people, you have some UV lamp, and people were saying, no, and I said, because we we'll always go with you, UV lamp, to look for the fungus, and I was like, oh, but this, a lot of bioluminescence on the floor, and then it was like this fox fire there, and it was full, full, full of fox fire, oh, and nothing to do. Now I want to say that, uh, that this kind of Asia connection with uh, Atlantic um, um, yeah. and this uh, way of looking at the things and this uh, coming back, the knowledge from the, our ancestors were uh, having and uh, being implicated in respect the knowledge, but also improving and also using the, the, the tools we have now, now in the present. Uh -huh. This is what I was defining at some point. I was saying like we are the cyber witches because we are using the tools that we have in the present to research about the alchemy it was in the past. No? Lo que vais a hacer esto ahora es hacer a extracción a través del solvent, que va a ser alcohol o etanol, que la gente va a poner aquí. No? Mina. Nunca os cogumelos tiveron un, con, un contido recreacionista, sino que un contido de, de reconexión con la tierra, tal, no sé qué, son, son, son um, usados en lo tradicional. Temos sobre con nuestro cuerpo, ¿no? Até un tiempo fue considerado como una planta, ¿no? Portanto, no es un, es un, no, un reino porque, animal. De hecho, eh, yo creo que es un, que un híbrido. When, when I actually, when we met personally, I mean, we were like talking about straight away, like, oh, you should take this. And you should take, it's like, you make a powder of something and you know of something because suddenly we, I mean, the social, um, the social and, and, and health experience somehow, you know, it's always crossing because yes. you want to be more dependent of good stuff, you know, of like, <laughs> And and it was so funny because our our first encounter was pretty much like exchanging this this you know kind of knowledge and and I think you know it's still something that is happening for centuries. That's, yes. that's part of our uh, social life and it's part of like keeping this um, keeping this knowledge also active, alive, vibrant. That's a really important point. And I mean, this is also really present in the exhibition in Nets of Haifei because, you know, all the research, Diana, that you did with the etchings and engravings and drawings throughout history, like from, I guess, starting in the 13th century and going all the way up to today, the knowledge, or even way back, yeah. yeah. But, you know, all the knowledge of this plant and how it has been used by women traditionally for abortion, to treat post uh, postpartum bleeding, um, but how it has also been a real problem infecting rye plants and people ingested it with bread uh, and didn't really know what they were um, that they were under the influence of this mushroom so i think sharing information in different ways and outside of the institutions that very often try to control that knowledge and try to define what kind of knowledge is the only and the only true knowledge mm. and this is really important and also the political work that both of you are doing que encontramos para colaborar também partiu de fazer um estudo profundo da planta, do, do ciclo do parasita com o fungo e como é que esta planta se relaciona com, com a saúde da mulher. Eu achei interessante tu falares do plátano, não é? Sim. Tal como com a mandrágora, Sim. eram tratamentos utilizados por healers e pelos monges, Sim. pelos peregrinos, para tratar o, o ergotismo, não é? Que no estamos, que no somos humanos de células, que no el cuerpo está compuesto por agua, bacterias, fungos, o sea, no somos so humanos. ¿no? Entonces, el contenido de interespecies ya está uh, inscrito no, no, cuando nacemos. ¿no? Lo que falla la cultura antropocéntrica es pensar que humano es humano, es fungo es fungo, y tenga el poderío de clasificarlo todo y ponerlo como en casillas, pero un poco como para poder entenderlo. ¿no? Entonces, la desconexión eso que tenemos ahora con la naturaleza, provocada por los sistemas reduccionistas, la ciencia capitalizada y todo el patriarcal, pues bueno, es pues face todo tipo de conexión. Mira, a cuarta vuelta. 
Bye 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 bye. That that brings us also together to start like something um, from the point of the more you know sort of like uh, obvious way, which was like like Paulo was talking about looking into a protocol and try our own way to create medicine with it, right? Or at least to like understand the very old process of 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 working with 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 the ergo because you know these days. You have a lot of institutions slowly applying like treatments for dementia, uh, uh, chronic depression, uh, Parkinson's. You know, there, there's like there's there, there there are there are parts of the synthesized ergo, which is you know pop, popular known as LSD. But pre LSD uh, moments were very much defined by this kind of interactions, right? Trying to create um, the medicine for, for ergo and understanding the portions. So that's how somehow we connected and, and Paolo suggested that straight away. Let's find the protocol. Our video will be about like following these steps and actually what you can do with it. Of course, Western science also has made amazing progress and has enabled uh, a lot of, you know, yes. survival. Also, you know, obviously access to it is not evenly distributed and whatnot, but there are really amazing protocols also in place in Western science. How do you mm -hmm. see this tension or how do you reconcile or even consider questions such as safety or, you know, how do you, how do you think about medicine and the advantages versus the alternative medicines that you are working with? I'm not really following these advances, but it's not really true because also when I do transorgans on a chip, I was also feeling, I mean, following like the, the last advance in medicine that is make an organ on a chip, no? And then you can try extractions of plants in this chip, no? But, um, yeah, what I want to say is like, I try to look from the connections of, for example, plants that you can extract alkaloids for the, I say before, no, but this was the point that I feel connects uh, our project because I was having really the protocols. Um, I mean, I have to look a bit on my things, but then I was like, I have extra alkaloid extraction and other things because I was really interested on, on that point and I have also the tools for doing it. But of course you need to check all these things because we are not in a, in a laboratory, but we can perform the laboratory. For me, it's not that we are speculating. We are just trying things that for me, speculation is another thing, but it's something that we are trying now. I mean, we are not saying like, this is down like that and like that is right. We are not performing uh, uh, the science we are criticizing. You know, we are trying the things to learn how to do it, then to have our own uh, conclusions. Having and those is, to also make it available. If yes, possible. and it's, this is something that it gets time to do it. It's not something that we appear and we do this thing. This is something that we were talking also with Kama, we were doing, Jan I was saying, this is a play for a whole life, you know? It's not something yeah. that we were doing the tools, we, were, we have to try in the tools and we have to make accessible for the people and then replicating then using this in a context that this is not the traditional medicine or science, science no? I think it's a, a, a way of uh, being a, a progress of being doing a step by step trials and experiments and sharing, I don't know. But I was, I was thinking about this method of somehow it's not repairing but it's 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 opening up it's making it more inclusive and looking at real problems that people have mm -hmm. like on their daily experience you know like with with the medical with the medical institution and with a pharmacy uh cooperative system in in, in general so i was i was also paula i don't know if you want to talk about that but i thought it was really fascinating the the, the work you initiated about gynecology as well and, and the tools. And I think that it's quite important in contrast with, you know, the sort of like uh, traditional, uh, the medicine we know today, you know, because we also need it, but having this project also brings a lot of future post-patriarchal possibilities, I think. Mm 
Yes. Yeah, this was also a really, as I explained before a bit, but coming from the another thing, this was also a rhizomatic, like uh, organism that we developed uh, like really strategically because there was, uh, yeah, we were like just a uh, group uh, trans feminists and we were uh, some people was working with body issues and microscopes and then other people were saying ah why we are not using that and then we we, we built the project together and then i was really connecting uh trans feminines with the biohacking network and make also by uh, um, yeah one people influence another one and being inspired by of course and we were uh, everyone was inspired by other ones and so this uh project was just yeah born from the necessity of uh cultural, I uh, know, a context of people that they really need these tools to, because they don't have insurance, for example. But this was a bit of oof, really big responsibility at the beginning because it's something that is you are playing with medicine. And this is like, this is the big, big science, no? Like, it was like, oh, wow, now we are mesh, meshing with medicine. I mean, we were doing noise before <laughs> and all kind of technologies and playing with the potential of the plants and making music and everything. And then at some point with the hackers, we realized, ah, we can do whatever we want. Great, let's do this project. And then we start to do this project. It's like, was just um, emerging from this uh, connection I explained before. And then this, yeah, um, now it has many tentacles. I mean, it's people just is working in some areas, other people is, um, yeah, I don't know, working more on, in, on the machines, other people is more working on plants, other people is machine, uh, um, putting everything together. And then, I mean, it's, everything is documented on the, on the, on the web pages, so you can really replicate and being involved because it was something like um, at the beginning was like, uh, I don't want to be the, I mean, we need more people involved to make this bigger. Uh, we were having okay. the network. Cyber witches. She is cyber witches, dinerpunk, and Hacteria. They were just, just on Petchland and we were doing that. And we continue doing it because it's something that you start to do is you cannot stop as a hacker. You cannot really stop to do it mm -hmm. because you know you can do more things. And it's something that, I mean, it's a, a process of doing, but it's also like a, um, a way to, to, to pass by, you know, because it's uh, something that you know is probably is it, it will not finish with your with you, but it's gonna be a, a progress to to have a seat for uh, all the people with all the all the things from that. Mm -hmm. no? It's not about necessarily uh, creating something. Yeah. Yeah, but but opening up, making it more accessible, and also I think reclaiming knowledge that has been taken from. Uh, indigenous people from women from yes. people who have knowledge of the land by pharmaceutical companies among others who create patterns and who keep the knowledge to themselves and I think it's not about saying that okay certain things um, shouldn't be treated with uh, traditional western medicine because you know clearly there are things that really work but it's about making accessible those very simple tools yeah, plans <laughs> that can be they can be used by everybody. And so I think this kind of opening up is really key here when it comes to counter strategies and other forms of world making and knowledge creation. Yeah, um, since I mentioned indigenous people now, I was wondering also, you know, how do you feel about that? Because a lot of times or what I see happening a lot now is also that, um, you know, Western cultures through kind of new age, uh, engagements and whatnot are going into fields of knowledge that have been ignored by Europe and North America and are rediscovering them, but also again, extracting and taking away knowledge from uh, people who've lived with the land for a much, for a much longer time. Is this something that you've been discussing? That was important in the process of like uh, doing this project last year, for example, because I feel like just the idea of like constant hallucination or contamination was a natural process of like doing what you're doing, you know, like from like harvesting the cereals to make bread from like assisting women on childbirth. This was like part of like a communal living and, and, it, and 
I think like there was there there are so much interesting debates about you know how people were um, appropriating knowledge and like abusing of of the the access that so many uh, cultures had like in terms of like the, the the knowledge of using hallucinogenic properties in rituals, but it's it's part of like. Um, uh, making access to to properties uh, like this, you know, like for example, uh, obviously, I feel the fact that people didn't know, like in the case of Portugal, for example, the the fact that people didn't know exactly why they were hallucinating, that was interesting to me because um, until very recently, people didn't go to hospital that often. And, you know, living in very small villages, people just manage to, to help each other, like every day, like from work to, to, to childbirth, to abortion, to tripping, you know, this was like part of like one big thing. And it was really challenging to me, like in 2020, trying to reach like very old ladies to tell me about the trips, like when they were like very young. Mm -hmm. I think this is the problem, uh, obviously from the knowledge that comes from indigenous communities is precisely because they live from the whole, uh, the vital life of the whole thing, right? And it's not just looking at one element. I mean, they're also structurally uh, very often put in a position where they don't have access to financial resources to pay for insurance and go to hospitals. And then the knowledge is also taken from people. Um, they're deprived of information, so kept also on purpose um, at a loss and without access, neither to traditional knowledge, because that is taboo or, you know, the psychedelic properties, they're not very, you're not supposed to, to take drugs basically, or what is uh, called drugs in uh, Western context. But on the other hand, you don't have access to hospitals, Western hospitals either. So there's really the structural disadvantage, I think, which is, um, which is happening and which I think you are, and also Paula through your biohacking practice, you're criticizing. Another thing is also trans rights, you know, transgender rights and the kind of processes that you have to go through in order to get treatment in Western cultures. Um, and it's completely absurd. So making, uh, making that more accessible, I think it's also an important part of the sort of, um, yeah, hack to, uh, hacking and hacktivist practice. I have one more question for you. And that is about pleasure and joy, um, because I think that's important for both of you. I know for you, Paula, that's been an important part. And I've been, or we're um, working together with the Seedbox Collaboratory in Sweden on a big exhibition here at Konzertrandheim on sex ecologies, where we're looking mm -hmm. into queer ecologies and especially also sexuality with an attempt to reclaim it from the Western erotophobic patriarchal um, mm -hmm. structures. So, so for that exhibition, we're also looking into pleasure. And I would love to hear both of your thoughts on, on pleasure, especially also because we're talking about, you know, hallucinations, uh, psychedelia, but also sex or, you know, gynecology uh, being related also uh, in one way or the other to sex. So I would love to hear your thoughts about that. When I know something or I have or I understand something, it it, it um, makes a pleasure on my my body, my mind, all those things. No, but also the the kind of uh, uh, approach of uh, trans noise when we were doing this project with Maria, no, it's like we were talking about noise and bodies and how we relate the noise with the transgender uh, and then we were uh, also touching uh, touching and collaborating with the ecosex movement i think that the the psilocybin <laughs> or the fungi uh, drug we were talking before is something that really i mean people talks about hallucination but i think that is a alterate state of consciousness i mean this hallucination is not something that is really not 
in the nature. I mean, it's there, but then if you are not in this state, uh, um, altered state alter of consciousness, but there's natural psychedelia. <laughs> yeah, but this other state of consciousness is not. Uh, I mean, it's natural psychedelia because it connects with the with the with the connections and the things that we cannot really see with the eyes. Uh -huh. When you are in this state, you yeah. can access to the to the inside of the plants. You can see inside because you are in this altered state, connect with the whole cosmos. And the approach uh, that, that we do with the gynecology, of course, it comes from the pleasure. It it comes from from uh, friends as Diana. They were. Uh, researching about how we ejaculate, how the woman ejaculate. Diana Porno Terrorista, another Diana we were, taught, we were working uh, 10 years ago. And this uh, Diana, Diana, Diana was writing a book about, um, that it has one is Porno Terrorist, and the second one is about how the woman ejaculate. I mean, it's a research about asking friends about um, how we ejaculate. And from that book, the, the, the project of, uh, researching about the glands and the ejaculatorial issues and, and Cloud was doing is like connected with this pleasure. I mean, all this project uh, is, uh, is coming from pleasure, actually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everything in life is coming from pleasure because if you have no pleasure to do things, you cannot really do it. So it's like something like it comes from a natural connection with the, with life, no? I, don't know. I was also thinking, you know how I think there's so many connections. You know, even like the policies with porn. You know, like that yeah, happened in the UK <laughs> two years ago, prohibiting like female ejaculation and 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 things like this. But I was also thinking about, you know, there are questions that just happen, like to come. Like I had a, a friend recently asking, "Oh, why don't we do like a DIY circuit bending for sex toys?" And I was like, well, that's that's pretty clever, you know. That we should we should know a bit more about what each other each, each person needs, like in terms. This of has a patent. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I, Sorry I to, to let you know, but it's like I have to do it already. <laughs> we can, we like, I have here once. I mean, we were we were doing it in Indonesia because they don't have sex uh, shops. Oh, so they dog. don't have shops. So in this uh, event, we were doing this ecological research, but we were doing a sex group to make in, uh, to work in pleasure also, besides mm -hmm. to the all the environmental issues, because they were not having like uh, they were not having access to the sex toys because they were not having sex shops. Okay, so, so you we were doing a recycle, recycle tech. No, no, we were, were no, we were doing. I don't have here any model, but we were doing a project that is called Dildomancy. But then I I talk about the pattern because if you do something with um, dildos, you have the problem. Some people makes a patent, mm -hmm. like in nineties, and there was many DIY projects. We want to do something with the dildos. You and have if you prototype, didn't you? Yes, I, I, it's, it's just, I think uh, I sent you in the, on, the, on the portfolio, I put some projects, I mean, this was an idea I have, uh, actually, there was having the, the shapes of the microorganism, and this is the idea I have, I have mm -hmm. this idea, like, a lot of time ago with uh, reading a book about... Uh, microorganism micro for macro pleasure. Yes, this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, 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 the experiment we did. But that approach was about pressure, but also training the muscles of the, and it was having this, I want this. This movement. Oh, that's a tentacle. That's amazing. Yes. Awesome. What is, is it, a dinosaur, the whole? It's a dinosaur, but don't, don't look that it's a dinosaur. It's a microorganism. <laughs> But this is this is from a dust dumpster diving in a in a so I, uh, his, uh, <laughs> university with my friend Uzda. I was also thinking, you know, going a little bit back to to the to to the research as well, like how you know sexuality was something always you know celebrated, sort of like even assisted, you know, in a sort of like ceremonial um, sort of like. Um, event in that you know from 
uh, the meters in Greece, you know, using the Kikion to, you know, to bring Persephone back or to, to wish like um, a healthy crop for the following year. You know, this mm. idea of sexual ceremony is connected with um, agriculture. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And for example, how I mentioned Hildegard in one of the artworks because she was a, a sort of like a, a, an entity that somehow is very connected to, um, to religion because she, you know, she lived in a monastery, but she wrote really important, mostly her visions on like herbalism and sexuality as well. Like 12th century, she was writing about, you know, yeah, um, women's orgasms. So I thought that was like, okay, you know, 12th century, it's, it's interesting. Like you, you were writing about that stuff or medieval ages or the fact that, you know, the ointments that healers and, and apparently called witches used were also like very frequently um, uh, through like the, their vaginas or, and you know, it was known that the ointments sort of like pleasure um, ceremonies or these acts were very connected to to that core, right? To that yes. sacral uh, energy. Um, and I thought that was very interesting, you know, just right. the, the yeah. connection of abolishing sexuality or making it visible that way. Right, and also why there's so little knowledge still today, um, you know, especially about, I mean, women, but also non-binary sexuality. It's uh, a lot of knowledge and information that is simply being suppressed. So I think by, uh, opening up and bringing in these alternative and additional forms of knowing and that are not patented. Uh -huh. I think that's really important <laughs> work. Yeah. And pleasure, of course, you know, bringing in joy as well, because in the end, um, that's one of the things from which we can create energy uh, and um, solidarity also among one another and support one another. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thanks to Stage and TBA21 for hosting us. Thank you. Thanks to everyone.